this is Tracy Hales Vass, right on Four Corners. Today I'm excited to interview the winner of the Tony Hillerman Prize, Carol Potenza, and her winning novel is titled Hearts of the Missing, a Mystery. Good morning, Carol. I enjoyed very much Hearts of the Missing, a Mystery. Well, thank you. And congratulations on the Tony Hillerman Prize. Thank you very much. It was a surprise. Was it a surprise? Oh, yeah. I had no way, shape, and form thought that I was going to win this prize. When I submitted the book, I thought, well, I'll get some good feedback. I'll work with the story a little bit more and then try to present it to a publisher. And uh, when I got that call, I was glad I was sitting down. What an honor. (laughs) It is. Well, before we go further, why don't you give our audience a little synopsis of Hearts of the Missing? Hearts of the Missing is a contemporary Southwestern um, mystery set on a fictional uh, pueblo in central New Mexico. The protagonist is a police officer on this pueblo, and she is not Native, so she's an outsider. And uh, the book explores a crime that occurs there that starts out as a suicide but turns into a murder and then is links that murder to a list of uh, Pueblo members that have gone missing in the past two years. And why they've gone missing is the heart of the science in the book. Um, I also add a little bit of Supernatural uh, as part of the mix, uh, toward, I hope, a very thrilling conclusion. It is thrilling, and the supernatural aspect is very natural in the setting. Thank you very much. It's um, All the stories in there are from my uh, sister-in-law, who actually does work on a pueblo west of Albuquerque, oh. and she came back with those stories, and she would sit around and tell us these stories, and uh, even the very first story the book opens up with, that's her experience. Nikki, our protagonist and police sergeant, she handled it pretty well, though she it got her attention. You know, when my sister-in-law was telling me these stories, and that's not even the only one she's told me, she seemed to handle it pretty well, too. I think it's because on the reservation, on the Pueblo, where she works, She's not the only one who experiences this. And so I won't call it commonplace, but I'll say that it's it's very accepted. And uh-huh. that was kind of the feel I wanted to give Nikki in the book, too. Like, well, I don't know that I believe it, but I'm not going to be scared by it. I right. Guess. Nikki's a very believable and strong woman character, and I like that. I enjoyed writing her. She yeah, I She is not my, my sister-in-law. I, it's always, I guess, when you're an author, you you write the people you kind of want to be, and there are a lot of elements in Nikki. She's very brave. She's not afraid to face someone right. that is giving her grief, and I am not that person. I <laughs> tend to kind of back away. So I gave her qualities that I wanted to have, I think, at some point, but that's not me. Right off the bat, you start off with the phrase, Saba Ashit de Yene. What language is that? So this is Keres or Carizan. Okay. It's, uh, there are a number of, there are 19 pueblos here in New Mexico. Mm-hmm. And uh, Keres is, is spoken on oh, three or four of those 19 uh, pueblos. Great. And they are, it's okay, they, they have a written language. So a number of the tribes have actually written this language down. So there are resources uh, that you can use basically online and in literature. And so I was able to kind of drop that in, and I hope that it would that kind of increase the the kind of reality of um, the Pueblo there. But it is not a true Pueblo, but it's set around real ones. Yes. What I wanted to do was not to choose a specific Pueblo. I, I have a lot of contacts on a couple of the Pueblos, uh, including my my sister in law, who's the police officer, and I they wanted anonymity because they still work there, right. and so I decided, okay, I'm not going to select a specific pueblo like Tony Hillerman and Ann Hillerman use the Navajo Nation, right? And and I didn't want to do that, 
and this gives me leeway to use basically, especially the, the supernatural or the gods and the myths, from a number of different pueblos across the state and introduce them. Tony Hillerman did a really good job with that because what he would do is he would have his uh, Diné or Navajo police officers interact with other pueblos so that you could pick up the different, uh, like I said, a skeleton man or the mm-hmm. clown. Uh, and I kind of wanted to do that in, in my own way without giving up the anonymity of my contacts who, like I said, still work on these these Pueblos. Right. So we'll see how that goes. Yeah. I hope that goes well going into the future. And uh, I did not want to make this uh, anything like that. I want to be as respectful as possible. I had people on one of the Pueblos actually read the book before it was submitted to make, to make sure that I was, I stayed respectful and I took their suggestions and changed some things in the book because of it. And I think that is very important. When you're writing about another culture uh, and traditions that are not part of my culture and tradition. And you can tell that you have a background in science. Yes. So when I decided to start to write, I always knew that I was going to add science. That was kind of my choice. So you've got that in this book and hopefully in the rest one, the rest of the ones that I hopefully will write and get published. But I really wanted that. I love thrillers and mysteries that have a science component in them. You know, just if yes. you think of Ann Patchett and I think State of Being and Michael Crichton's Jurassic Park are big ones. I love that. And so I thought, I can do that. Oh, oh I did. Are you still teaching now? As a matter of fact, I am. I teach. Uh, biochemistry to undergraduates at New Mexico State University, and I've been grading papers all day. So how do you balance (laughs) your writing process with teaching college courses, especially undergraduate college courses? It's not easy. Um, The only time I really have a chance to write is early in the morning. Uh So I get up, and I try and be relatively disciplined, get up about 4.30 and start to write around 4.45 or 5 o'clock. And then I go until about 7.30 and get ready for work. My first class starts at 9.30. So I come in and do my prep. And uh, at that point, I'm kind of done for the day with writing because when I get home, I want to spend time with my husband and not not have my writing life and my, my work life kind of interfere with our family right. life that way. But, yeah, it's, it's hard to get time in there. So I try and write uh, at least five days a week, uh, Monday through Friday in the morning. Could you take a few minutes and read something from Hearts of the Missing for us? Sure. No problem at all. Um, so let me set this scene up. This is actually in the first chapter. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm going to read the ending of the scene. Um, but the scene is that uh, the protagonist, uh, Sergeant Nikki Matthews, is at a break-in in a mini-mart. And she's been processing the scene when she hears a suspicious noise. And so she kind of creeps around inside the mini-mart to look outside and see if the perpetrators have come back. It's It's still kind of nighttime almost breaking dawn. She waits for a few minutes and then the noise doesn't come back and I'm going to start right at this point. Okay. Okay. Had she been mistaken? A movement caught her eye between the gas pumps and she snapped her head to the right, her body tensed. A flash of color, Nikki stepped out of the shadows, not worried about the sound of scattering glass as she tracked the motion of A skinny brown res dog wandered around the side of her unit, nose to the ground. Lifting its head, it sniffed the air. It trotted toward an overflowing trash can and rose up on its hind feet, one paw positioned delicately against the side. Nikki's lips pressed tight. You could count the ribs on that poor animal. Most likely it was a stray, but she never knew it might belong to anyone in the village. Relieved she had an answer to the sounds, Nikki holstered her pistol. Suddenly tired, she stretched, arching her back. Outside, the sky was beginning to gray. She checked the clock on the wall above the door. The sun would be up in a few minutes, and it would take another hour to process the crime scene. Then she was going to canvas the nearest homes, 
to see if anyone had heard or seen anything. She probably wouldn't be done until hours after her shift was officially over. Her gaze focused closer, and she stared at the pale oval of her reflection in what was left of the glass window in front of her. Dark brown eyes stared back as she ran her hand over the top of her head and slid her fingers through the smooth, straight black hair of her ponytail. She was mistaken for Native all the time, not by Indian, but by non-Indian she encountered at the reservation on the cas- at the casino. She sighed deeply, glanced at the dog one more time, and froze. A wave of unease washed over her, this time prickling up her back. The animal stared at the front of the store, fixated not on the place where she stood, but to the left of the window's edge at the place where she'd first heard the noise. Her hand dropped to her sidearm, and Nikki jerked her head around. An old Native woman stared at her through the glass. No, not through the glass. In the glass. The old woman's face was in the glass. Their eyes met, and every nerve in Nikki's body stretched taut. The woman's pupils glowed black, glittering and alive, sharp points embedded within a deeply wrinkled face, an ancient, disembodied face. Nikki knew she was supposed to look away, had been told in no uncertain terms by her traditional friends on the res, but she couldn't move. She was transfixed. The sun flashed over the horizon, blinding her, but not before the woman smiled and turned away. Her long white hair whipped in the light, and she was gone. Nikki yanked out her gun, hit the front door of the mini-mart hard, and ran outside into the brightness of the dawn, skidding on broken glass. The same scraping sound that had alerted her only a few minutes before grated along her skin. A flash of white raced away, and her arms swung up, the muzzle of her sidearm tracking a rabbit that zigged and zagged out of the parking lot, across the road, and into the grass next to the trampled dirt path. She swiveled to the dog. It cringed and shivered as it stared after the rabbit, before it backed up and loped away through the brush, tail tight between its legs. Nikki's flesh crawled with goosebumps, heart thudding, She pointed her weapon to the ground, clutching its diamond pattern grip so tightly it cut into the skin of her palm. Scowling, she slammed her weapon back into its holster. The old woman was back. That meant life was about to get complicated and a lot more dangerous. Yeah, the old woman was back. That line right there (laughs) tells so much. And my sister-in-law has seen this old woman a few times, and she's not the only one. Oh, wow. So she would tell these stories, and boy, your hair would stand on it. I can only imagine. And I think we can say that the trio that she runs with, I really like them. Um, Her best friend, Savannah. Savannah. and Ryan. Yeah, Savannah and Ryan, they're really quite the two friends for her and they all always kind of eat dinner together i like that their dinners are always so new mexican (laughs) yes enchiladas or tortillas exactly (laughs) green chili mac and cheese yes yes (laughs) i wanted i wanted my protagonist not to be native and to be very respectful of the culture because i didn't want to delve into the traditional practices at any depth. I don't want any secrets. I want those barriers to remain. Right. And I wanted Nikki to be that way. So having these insiders that are were born on the reservation or part of the tribe, that could kind of explain to her what was going on without giving away too much. And then to have Savannah be the non-traditional one who doesn't believe, and Ryan to be a very traditional um, member of the tribe who does believe in the spirits and the supernatural, it gave a really nice contrast. It really Um, did, since uh, Savannah is of the Fire Sky tribe, but Ryan is of the Apache tribe. Right, and raised on the reservation. But he doesn't qualify for membership because of his genetics, and that's a big part of the novel is is who is an insider and who is an outsider, and how are they an insider and outsider? Is it because you weren't raised there, or is it because of your genetics, or is it because 
you don't have the right genetics, but were raised there, and that becomes a very contentious issue. It really does. We're we're bordering here on eugenics and the whole thing. We are, and it's it's very difficult. I think one of the things it, when I was doing my research that that fascinated me was that these tribes are very sovereign. They want the ability to choose who gets to be a member of their tribe and who does not get to be a member of their tribe. And there's a lot of talk about blood quantum right. um, in this, and this has to do with you know your percentage of ancestry and uh, your relatives and your relationships and who you're related to. But it's different from tribe to tribe to tribe. Right. And um, like I said, they wanted that power, whereas before the U.S. government kind of said, no, you're an Indian, no, you're not. Right. Um, they want that kind of power. So I thought that was kind of an interesting aspect to put in there. It really added a depth to the whole mystery. And the whole aspect of the null antibodies or antigens. Well, thank you. Uh, that I had a... So I have a lot of sister-in-law. I had another (laughs) sister-in-law who worked as a nurse doing kidney dialysis on a couple of the the Pueblos up there. And she would always come uh, come and talk about how it was too bad Native Americans didn't get their genetics and DNA done because they can't qualify for organ donation and there's not enough organs out there for people who need them. And that just fascinated me Yes. Um, as to why they didn't. And so I started looking into that and realized that Native Americans don't, don't get their DNA done, at least they haven't in the past. Mm-hmm. And it's more for a um, exploitation. They don't want to be exploited, plus some traditional reasons. So which idea, what idea came first here? Was it the character? Was it the science? Was it the, the setting? Which is a huge part of the novel. Uh, so I didn't write this novel for the Hillerman Prize. I right. remember getting about halfway through it and thinking, wow, this could be like a Tony Hillerman novel. <laughs> it was really, <laughs> yes, it was really, I would say they all came together at one time with my sister-in-law working as a police officer, mm-hmm. listening to her stories um, and her supernatural stories. I loved that aspect. And then listening to my other sister-in-law talk about the genetics and the, the lack of organ donations and transplants. And then at the same time, we had those terrible, just a number of murders and, and disappearances in Juarez. Right. And a lot of those were linked to black market organ right. operations. Yes. And everything just kind of like, wow, could I put this all together to make it into a book, and I just started thinking about it, and this is what, what ended up coming out. Well, what's it's, next? It's, Will we, are we going to get to meet Nikki again? So I've written a second book. Good. Um, and it's in a series, so it, it's a few months later, essentially. It starts a few months later, um, because I kind of wanted to go through the, the um, seasons in oh. New Mexico. So okay, right. this one is kind of going into fall. It's, mm-hmm. I think this one's a summer, so there's a lot of drought and heat and fires. Right. And then I've, I've, I've started a third that is essentially going to go into the winter um, of it. And then I have a, a one that I want to go, uh, a fourth one, where it'll be those spring winds that we get that yes. no one really understands until you're in New Mexico. Um, so, yeah, I, I really would like to write a series. I had originally planned four books and kind of put the story arcs in um, for the characters in the four books. Each individual book would have its own mystery to solve, and then the relationships of the characters through the four books would kind of arc all the way through. And speaking of wind, that was something in Nikki's um, life that was almost um, paranormal, but yet might not have been, is how the wind always was teasing her hair. Yes. (laughs) Yes. <laughs> I, I found that kind of creepy, and so I thought, wow, that would be kind of neat. It if, was. If, if I did something like that. Those are those kind of things you weave in later. Oh. You know, you come through and you, yeah, you weave those in a little bit later and, and kind of stitch stitch the plot together with some of those oh, yeah. little elements. 
And uh, I I like that. I, I did too. She's always playing with her hair. The wind was always kind of ruffling around right. around her. And I liked that. I like that. Because our touch. spirit is wind mother. Right. In the next book and in the book after that, I have more ghost stories Great. that I were told. And so I've adapted those as the supernatural element in the next book and the book after. And oh, I have a, a wonderful, wonderful story. I went on a uh, ride along with a conservation officer on oh. one of the Pueblos, and he told me of just the scariest story um, that I'm going to do for the fourth book. It's just frightening. We have our conservation quote unquote officer in this one. Yes. We do. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not going to say any more about yes, that. He's actually based on a conservation officer I met at one of the reservations. He's not the same person. I don't really know this person. But I remember you know, interviewing this person, and he says, you know, I, he's not Native American, he goes, but when I'm out there, he said, I even pick up trash. This is the wilderness, it needs to be pristine, we need to keep this. And I remember thinking, oh my gosh, I had my character, who's the conservation officer, and kind of a potential love interest for Nikki over the four books, pick up trash. I (laughs) love it. Wow. You mentioned that you have a writer's group, they have read together, tell me about that. So I live in Las Cruces. I go up once a month with my husband. His family is in Albuquerque, and I go to a writer's group up there. It's the Land of Enchantment Romance Authors. It's the uh, first group that I could find. And so I started going to this group. This is how I met Sabra from the other other interviews. Mm -hmm. It has been wonderful. It's not just for romance writers. We have science fiction writers. We have fantasy authors. Um, In the group, we have women's fiction authors in the group. It's a great mixture, plus the romance writers. And a lot of the information that you get in this group um, is just great for learning how to write. And I really needed that. Have you always been a writer? No. I was a reader. I read. My mom introduced us to reading, and I read voraciously for years. Now, when you become a scientist, you have to do writing, but it's very different. It is. Than the type of writing in a fiction book. So I would write for, you know, my scientific research papers, and I would write for my abstracts and posters and that kind of stuff. But I never actually wrote a story until a few years ago when I have, uh, we have two children, and they, they graduated from college here at New Mexico State and kind of went off on their own. And all of a sudden, I have nothing to do in my off time. (laughs) Wow. I was bored. And so I thought, wait a minute, maybe I should just try and write a book. I sat down. I I was a New Year's resolution. I started on January 1st at 4.30 in the morning. I sat down and I started writing. And I wrote for about a year or two. And then I thought, you know, I, I finished some of these books. Are they any good? Who do I get to read? And that's when I found... Lyra, the Land of Enchantment Romance Authors. Mm-hmm. And when I wrote this book, I put this in their contest. They have a fundraising contest, and it final. And that gave me the confidence to submit it to the Tony Hillerman Prize. Well, thank you very much, Tracy. Like I said, it's, I'm really, really happy that I got to do this. And that was Carol Potenza, the author of the Tony Hillerman Prize book, Hearts of the Missing. This is Tracy Hales Vast, right on Four Corners, on KSJE 90.9 FM in Farmington, New Mexico. Mm-hmm.